and this is Fernandi here to read Chasing Vermeer by Blue Belliet. We are on chapter 14, so if you could turn to page 134 in your book and read along with me. The chapter name is Flashing Lights. Calder arrived at Powell's that afternoon just as Mr. Watch was folding the top closed on a large paper bag. He nodded to Calder and began lettering S-H-A-R with an indelible marker on the outside. Indelible means permanent. Before Calder could say anything, Mr. Watch pointed toward a massive pile of children's picture books, need to be shelved. He turned back toward the bag and added P-E. But I'd like to deliver that, Calder blurted. I mean, she's nice, he added lamely. Nice, he thought to himself, hardly. Mr. Watch stood up and adjusted his suspenders. I can drop them off myself after work. Calder looked miserably at the picture books. When Mr. Watch went to use the bathroom, Calder rushed over to the bag and peeked inside. They didn't look like the kinds of books most people would bother with. There were several on the history of mathematics, a book called On the Plurality of Worlds, and another called The Roots of Coincidence. Calder heard the toilet flush and hurriedly closed the top of the bag. Funny that Mrs. Sharp was also thinking about coincidences. He worked extra quickly on shelving the picture books and returned to the front desk. Mr. Watch was surprised and gave him a smile that revealed a row of small pointed teeth. No wonder the man usually kept his mouth closed. Need that delivery now? Calder asked. Mr. Watch shrugged. Fine, he said, then reached into his pocket as if to find something. Wait, no, never mind. go ahead. Calder hurried south on Harper Avenue. Should he stop at Petrus and let her know where he was going just in case something happened? No, that was ridiculous. When the door opened, Calder was surprised to see Mrs. Sharp looking almost friendly. The wrinkles in her face were arranged into something that resembled a smile. Come in while I get you a check for you, boy. Calder was left to look around again for several moments. This woman had money, no doubt about it. What did she do all day? Calder noticed a hefty pile of papers next to her computer. They were too big to sit on her desk and had their own fold-out table. Maybe she was a writer, a writer and a thief. When Mrs. Sharp returned, Calder shifted his weight from one foot to the other, hoping she'd get the hint. She paused to look at his feet as if there was something wrong with them. Calder took the plunge. Mrs. Sharp, would it be possible for me to use your bathroom? I'm not feeling well. Mrs. Sharp waved a bony hand behind herself. Up the stairs, turn left. Then she gave Calder a hawk-like glance as if to say, I'm old, but I'm not that old. Calder, sweating already, scurried up the stairs. They creaked horribly under his boots. Once at the top, he paused, trying to make, take in as much as possible. Sure enough, to his right, he saw a large standing wardrobe, a perfect storage place. It looked almost identical to the one behind the geographer in Vermeer's painting. Mrs. Sharp's voice came from downstairs. The switch is high, inside the door. Got it, Calder called back, fumbling on the wall inside the first room he came to. The light went on in a huge bedroom. There was another wardrobe with carved panels, this one covering most of the far wall. Oops, Calder called down, trying to sound lost. He was back out in the hall, the bedroom light off. Ah, the bathroom. Calder shut the door, flushed hurriedly, and took several deep breaths. On his way down the stairs, he noticed a built-in cabinet with heavy doors beneath an old bench on the landing. The house was nothing but wooden storage places. Thanks, Mrs. Sharp, Calder said, realizing he probably didn't have to overdo it on not looking well. He stuffed the check in his pocket. See you soon. The front door was, clo was closed almost before he was out of it. The old woman clearly wasn't big on goodbyes. Calder went directly to Petrus and invited her back to his house. It was quieter there, and they had to get his discoveries written down. Petra carried the Vermeer notebook. On the way over, she said happily, my dad just got home. He was doing some kind of research for his department. Strange it had to be so secret, isn't it? Not so strange, Calder mumbled. Secrets seem almost normal these days. Together, they sat on the floor of Calder's room. First, Petra wrote down the titles of the books Calder remembered from Mrs. Sharp's bag. Then Calder sketched the standing war wardrobes. They each ate several blue ones before there was a knock at the door. Calder, a letter for you. 
His dad gave him a quick smile. Looks like another one from Tommy. Calder tore it open and began decoding as Petra watched, fascinated. How did you learn to do that, she asked. I made it up, he said, glad she happened, she'd happened to see. Then he began to understand what he was reading. It said, oh my goodness, can we do this together right now? Mm, I think you're going to have to do it on your own. Remember, the code is on page 57. So you can pause right here if you want to and do it. I wonder, I'll pause too. Let's all pause right here. All right, let's see if we can do it. Okay, I figured it out. Did you? It says Calder, Fred, look at, I, when I rush, I don't do as well. Calder, Fred moved out. We want to come home, but no money. Tommy. Poor Tommy and his mom stuck there. Whoa, Petra, there's something else we've got to do. We've got to rescue Tommy. Calder and Petra spent most of the weekend baking brownies and selling them on Harper Avenue. They explained to the neighbors that they were raising money for Tommy Segovia and his mom Zelda to come home because Tommy's new stepfather had deserted his family in New York. There one day, gone the next, was Calder's way of putting it. Everyone was sympathetic and everyone bought. Late Sunday afternoon, as the grand total of $129 was being stuffed into several coffee cans to go to the bank, there was news about the theft. The news was local. According to the evening broadcast, an elderly woman in Chicago had just notified the authorities about re receiving a strange delivery. That delivery was a letter that arrived back in October, and that woman was Louise Coffin Sharp. She was asking for police protection. What? shouted Petra and Calder together. They dropped the jar of quarters they'd been counting and rushed around the corner to where Calder's parents were watching TV in the next room. The broadcaster read the letter aloud. Petra and Calder stared at each other. It sounded exactly like the letter Miss Hussey had described to her class. The broadcaster explained that for an older woman living on her own, it had required an act of great courage to finally take the letter to the police. The broadcaster clearly had never met Ms. Sharp. Oh my God, the letter was delivered right down the block. Calder's mom clapped her hand to her forehead and Calder, you were just over there. Mrs. Sharp is involved, Calder said to Petra in a low voice. Do you think she was waiting all that time for the thief to go back, get back in touch with her? Who can tell? And think of Miss Hussey's letter. This can't be pure coincidence, Petra said. It's too close. Do you remember that Louise Sharp's husband was a Vermeer scholar? Calder's dad said to his mom, do you remember that Louis's husband was a Vermeer scholar? What? Calder and Petra asked in one voice. Calder's dad said he remembered hearing that Mrs. Sharp's husband had been murdered in Europe many decades ago and that he had been doing research on Vermeer at the time of his death. Calder and Petra stared at each other. Murdered how, Dad? Calder asked. Mm, I don't remember, but I think it was considered a random street crime, a horrible case of being in the wrong place at the wrong time. They never arrested anyone. Poor Mrs. Sharp, Petra said. Well, that could explain some of her odd behavior. And maybe more, Calder added. The phones rang nonstop all over Hyde Park that night. Looking out of his, his living window after Petra went home, Calder could see the blue flash of police cars and knew they must be stationed outside Mrs. Sharp's house. She'd be safe, no question about that. A nagging doubt crept into Calder's mind. Could Mrs. Sharp be so clever that she had framed herself? He wouldn't put it past her. Even though her husband had been killed, it was hard to picture her being so afraid, so afraid so many years later. And Mrs. Hussey, Mrs. Hussey, what was going on with her? The pieces just didn't fit. Petra, three houses away, followed the flashing lights on her ceiling, her thoughts falling into rhythm with the pulse of blue. What about the letter she had picked up that day on Harper Avenue? Had that been one of the original three? Was Mrs. Sharp really a victim now? Was Miss Hussey? Petra's thoughts swirled in circles, refusing to make sense. So what do you think? Who is the one, who's, in, who's the suspect and who is the actual thief? Such a mystery.